I'm SP from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a show about the general Marvel comic universe, part of the Guinea Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other hilarious and fun geeky shows at guineageeknetwork.com. This is the official gunageek.com show. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven, Chris, and SP. Welcome to an all-new episode of the official gunageek.com show. After a week away, I am Steven, scratched his nose with the screw John Drew. And joining me, of course, is Chris Farrell. Thanks for joining us in this world geek. <laughs> a live audience gets what that's a reference to. And also, SP is here. I'm so glad the scratch was from a screw and not from a frame nailing gun, because that would be more than a scratch. Uh, uh, so I totally um, have sawdust all over my water because I've been building a shed over the last week, which has been fun. Lots of fun. Um but uh, not without incidents, but I, I considered getting the framing framing nailer, but um, I actually ordered one and it showed up and the nails were next to impossible to find. So I was like, oh, I don't want to spend more money. So I just sent it back, sent it back to Amazon. It was this massive package. It was hilarious. Was it an electrical or a pneumatic? It was pneumatic. Hmm. I, and you have an air compressor? Of course I have. Capable of, of yeah, running yeah. a yeah. framing nailer? Yeah. Yeah. All I right. got a, a 20 gallon. I think it's 20 gallon. 20 well, gallon? it's not the gallons. It's the PSI. Yeah, but uh, the PSI was enough, too. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm here. I'm here to uh, podcast. And I've got a couple people here who decided to come along. Contractually, I have yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't an option for either of us. Otherwise, mm. we would have stayed home. Uh, I have to. Truth be told. So I mentioned this uh, a couple different places. Uh, last week, I took a, a little staycation, had to take some vacation time, decided to stay at home. I, I, I said to myself, I'll probably start on the shed, but I did a lot more than I planned on it. But that was really the only thing that I had to do. And oh, I go you know, check out my dad's new, new place that he's in. Those were the only two things that I had. And that's one of the reasons why I I'd, I'd said, hey, guys, do you mind if we take a week off of Gunna Geek? But I, I miss you guys. I miss doing the podcast last week. It was nice, even though had a little bit of delays getting the show started today. Uh, it's nice to be back in the saddle. We know the real reason why you were pushing to get the shed done, and that is because all the cheap preseason sales on Christmas lights are coming <laughs> really soon, and you want to get exactly what you want in order to light that puppy up. So we know why you're pushing for it. I'm ashamed. My wife had to remind me that it was an extra place I can hang Christmas lights. Now, that's not to say I hadn't already thought about something Christmas light related to do with it, but I didn't think about the fact that I got to get a new strand of lights for, for on the shed. You were thinking of storing your Christmas lights inside. You weren't Ooh. thinking of decorating it <laughs> a as little Christmas. Bit, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Uh, Chris Farrell, last week while I was away, I heard that you have a new host on all things good and nerdy. Uh, her, her name's Karen. Is that what I heard? Karen D. Nelson. Okay, Karen D. Nelson. Fair enough. And if you want to know what that's about, you can check out all things good and nerdy on Sundays. If you want a wacky, what's your phrase? Wacky Sunday morning wake up show? Wacky, wacky weekend morning show is what it was at one point in time. We kind of stopped using that branding. You can yeah. uh, you can check that out on Sunday at, uh, time is it again? 11 a.m. Eastern. 11 a.m. Eastern. <laughs> This is a great plug. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's about on par with the quality we put out in that show. How much Canadian beer have you had on your staycation? <laughs> I'm coming down off of a lot of it. Uh, let's go ahead, though, and move on. You're, ne never mind. I was going to make a Canadian legalized joke. Let's move on to the news. <laughs> It's back. That's right. There's more, more Wink news. <laughs> if you aren't familiar with Wink, Wink is the name of a smart company, and they were one of the early ones to really get the ball rolling with the smart technology. They had a hub called the Wink Hub, and you could hook up a whole bunch of things to it in order to be able to do smart stuff. If it was Z-Wave or Zigbee, it was your cent central brain, and they had a lot of good stuff in there. It was the first 
hub that I used. It was, I think, the first hub that Chris Farrell used. And it was a it was a good product. And then for a while, it was very, very good until it became not good. And then after a while of being not good, they said, you know what? Our service is so bad, we're going to charge for it. And so back in May, they had announced that they were going to be going to a subscription model. This was on May 6th. They had announced that effective May 13th, 2020, which was a week later, it was going to go to a subscription model. And then when that day came around... They went, no, we're going to wait another week or so. And then when that day came around, they went, you know what? We know some of you have signed up, but we'll hold on to that credit card information and we'll just postpone the subscription for now. We'll give you a little bit more time. We're, we're very impressed with the amount of people that we saw come and subscribe. So they held off, but now... It has been announced that officially as of July 27th, 2020, they will begin charging for the Wink model. This is a quote from blog.wink.com. We want to share updates about our Wink subscription, a vital change for Wink that will enable us to provide our customers with a strong and growing smart home experience. The change will bring about expanded support for new brand integrations Sorry, that was a lot of buzzwords. And continue to bring enhancements through firmware and software updates. Please know that we have adjusted our timeline since our initial announcement on May 6th to allow more users opportunity to make considerations. We were able to extend our service, so subscriptions will now begin on May Ju- May, or on Monday, July 27th, 2020. All users who have not already subscribed will need to visit subscription.wink.com to sign up. Users with a hub on their account should subscribe with the same email address that is registered with their hub. Paid subscribers can continue using all of their connected devices, cloud services, automations, and third-party integrations. Now, this is the interesting part that seems a little bit different from where we first saw this. They also said the following, quote, users who do not sign up will still have access to limited functionality without being charged. This will specifically allow for local control over selected devices, such as those found in the lights and power menu, as well as Z-Wave connected locks, end quote. That's a new piece of information that I don't remember seeing before. So essentially all of the actual interesting stuff, all of you know the smart assistant integration, the programming, the robots, the things that actually make your system smart will not work if you're not subscribed. But if you're on the network, you do actually have the local control to turn on and off any of those um, Z-Wave devices. So it says Z-Wave specifically in here, but the previous thing says um, local control over selected devices. So I don't know if Zigbee is also going to be part of this. I would assume. I would assume so too. Um, so, hey, at least now the hub will have some level of functionality if you don't subscribe. So you're not like you're not completely hosed if you don't subscribe and you had a um, had something on there, but you can't do anything with it. They're just taking 98 percent of the functionality uh-huh. away. That's all. Exactly. I, you know, I, I'm. I, I still say why, um, but I think we now know the answer of why there was the delay, which was the fact that they wanted to be able to say, hey, we're not taking away everything. And they had to switch some programming so that they could have this, you know, two layers of functionality. But here's the kicker. They gave everyone just enough time that they could go and research what it is they wanted to do since they gave them that nice little, oh, we're, we're not going to charge, but we still might in the future. So everyone went, <laughs> screw you guys. You're about to hose me. I'm going to figure out what the services I'm going to. And I wonder how many people dumped Wink between when this was first announced and when today's announced, or when this happens on July 27th, how many people will have left the service? Because I bet you it's a lot. Yeah, I I think that they definitely um, cost themselves a few dollars by, <laughs> by not doing that. Because there are people who absolutely would have gone, well, I need another month. I'll just pay the month. I'll, I'll pay it, but I won't like it. And uh, I don't know. Maybe they, 
I, again, I theorized before that they might have done this for legal reasons that by waiting, they can um, mitigate, mitigate any exposure they have with such a short notice. Maybe they maybe there's a certain amount of lawsuits that they closed off is sort of what I'm thinking. That's a oh, random I'm sure there's still I'm sure there's a class action someone's going to file because remember everything about their advertising and everything that was described about the product. And in fact, it's probably on the box art if I can find it still is no subscription Free online services, stuff like that. I'm sure in the fine print, they wrote some way around that. But this is what it was built upon was the fact that, oh, no, no, there's no subscription fee to use this service. And yeah, I get it. It's expensive to maintain the servers and stuff like that. But more of their problem is the fact that they haven't innovated. Nothing new has come out in years. Once Will I Am bought the company, in fact, it seems like they were in worse straits. Their yeah. support staff has been stripped down to nothing. So when you go ask for help, it takes like a week before someone gets back to you. The company's been in bad shape for years. This is just the final straw for a lot of people. And I know, remember, we talked about it on this show before, they let some of their service certificates expire. Mm-hmm. So it broke wink for like half a day because certificates were expired on their servers. So you couldn't reach back out and do anything. It's just issue after issue because they haven't put any more money into it. And they're trying to figure out how do we monetize this? The ship has sailed on that. Your service is not that great. The hardware, not that great. And you go and look at the other home automation tools out there and there's better solutions at this point in time. So uh, this is probably the final end for it. I'm sure you'll have a few people that stick around until it's gasping, dying last breath. And my (laughs) hope is before they finally shut the doors, they open source it or something like that so that they make it so that people can retrofit or modify their own wink hubs to be able to run things on a server they own or something like that so that it keeps running. By the way, I was at Home Depot a few times, and the Not Home sure. De- the, the local Home Depot here still actually has at least one in stock. I, every time I walked out, it's behind the little cage, and it, and they're still trying to sell it full price. It still says like 140 bucks. I felt I mean, like going up to the manager and being like, "Hey, I know that you're like a, a home hardware type person. You're you're a a tool person." This, this is dumb to sell this, <laughs> like you know. I mean, that was also part of the problem they had is you couldn't buy the hardware for a while there. You couldn't buy a Wink Hub 2 for like months at a time because there was no stock anywhere. So you were looking yeah. like on eBay or Amazon resellers and stuff like that. So th- the writing has been on the wall and it did what it did needed to for me rather, which was get me started, let me dip my toes in. And I'm slightly more con- well it's sam i went to samsung smart things hub i'm more reasonably confident that that's probably going to exist because samsung's a bigger company and if this loses them a little bit of money they have other things that offsets it and they're probably playing a long-term game long-term game on this but it may go away too and this is the world we live in is you've got to start realizing hmm i need to buy devices that can live outside of one singular ecosystem and thankfully all of the smart devices i have in my house will work on pretty much any of the smart hub devices that are out there. So I didn't have any Wink specific devices that are now hosed. Because remember, they were supposed to be putting out like a Wink specific security system and all sorts of Wink specific sensors that I'm sure are probably just yeah. Z-Wave or Zigbee, but were designed to work automatically with it and be branded hand in hand with Wink. Well, that never happened because in the past three years, they promised a lot and underdelivered. <laughs> it, it shouldn't surprise anyone. And I'm taking shots here because it's frustrating. Because they should have been in a better position. But this yeah. is a company that in the span of like four or five years has been bought and sold three or four different times. And each time they've been sold, it seems like things got worse instead of getting better because nobody knew what to do with them. Well, all I know is that um, we are better off not being on Wink, Chris Farrell. I'm going to be the contrarian here. Oh, I'm going to the say... Contrarian. Yeah, I'm going to say that this is not an entirely bad thing. Now, I've heard everything that you guys said. I actually own a Wink 2 hub, never used it, never plugged it in, still sitting in the same box it came in. And I said, I think the last time that I was going to sell it on eBay, well, it's made it to the photo box, but I haven't actually listed it on (laughs) eBay. And I probably should now. But if you take a look at Amazon... If you have a Prime subscription, a portion of that is going to fund their smart home hub integration, right? Samsung is solely hardware. It doesn't have any 
any software that I know of that is actually funding the software hub development. And I've also got the, uh, the hub, the Nexia hub, that is my uh, train HVAC system hub. And I could subscribe to something through train on that, but not necessarily through Nexia. So out of the four, there are two, and I, I realize there's more like Philips, uh, Hue and stuff like that. But out of the four that I have access to in my house, two of them have some sort of subscription service. Now, Wink and Amazon, it's not necessarily a bad business model to give a certain amount away for free and then higher tier levels you give away at a paid plan. Now, Wink has screwed themselves left, right, and backwards. So they're not in a great position right now. This might be the only position that they have in order to stay in business. And there are people out there today, even today, that are still Wink apologists and want to stay with that. I don't know if it's because it's what they know or because they believe in the freedom versus the lockdown versions that you get with other hubs out there. But there is something to be said about this. Now, do I believe for a second that this is going to be successful in the short term? No, there's going to be have to be a lot of venture capitalism that's thrown in here in order to make this survive to the point where it might be profitable or might be sustainable. But I don't think this is actually a bad idea. I think that it definitely... Um could be warranted to have a subscription. I think they're overcharging. Um, and especially given, given their current state. Um, but if you want me to subscribe, you have to give me something more than what you've been giving me. To pivot all of a sudden and say, oh, you need to subscribe to maintain the same level of service you've been having. That's an F you to me as a customer. They really should. Yeah, I, I, I agree they should be offering more. Um, but they're in a situation that makes it difficult to, to offer anything when they're in a poor state as it is. The situation right? is they have no money. Let's uh -huh. be honest here. That's what it is. There's been stories on the various tech blogs and things like that about how their sports staff has been stripped away, how new development has been stripped away because they can't afford it. So why they're doing this is they're bleeding money running and maintaining servers. So they're yeah. trying to plug the holes to try and figure out the next step. But okay, you plug the holes, but let's say arbitrarily, Let's say 50% of your user base is gone. How do you rebuild that? What's the what's the perk you give people to be like, mm, I need to stay in the Wink ecosystem? That's new hardware, thing. honestly. Uh, the Hub 3. If you can arrange it, that would be something that would state that they were in the game so, for the long term. So what would you put in Hub 3 that makes it a must-buy for someone compared to Hub 2 or buying an Amazon Echo Hub or using Google Home or something like that at this point in time? You would definitely have to do something with a screen. If they could, mm -hmm. if if they came out with something that was like, this just makes sense, where maybe it was even a, a, a more user-friendly interface or like there was a web interface or there was just something that was brand new. I, I see what you're saying, Chris, and I, I agree with you. I think that that would be, be something that showed them. But it, the hub situation, if they came out with a hub and they were making people still pay for it, which they would have to because the price of that, you know, you think about it, it they're trying to start charging customers for it. So they, if they're charging a customer 10 bucks a month and then they turn around, and they're like, hey, we're going to give you a $200 free product. Well, that takes a, lot, a, lot, a while for them to make back that money. Um, so they're going to have to now go and give the charge people for the hub. And that's going to be a whole other problem. I don't know that I agree that the hub's the solution, but I agree that they would need to offer something that is benefit. What, what if you merge it with a company like Sonos? Like Wink and Sonos. Wink would be the smart home it's, background. Sonos, Sonos is already baked in and gone Amazon and Google route. They don't really care. They rely on those aspects to do a home automation. What I mean, and from their point of view, why would you buy Wink, a financially struggling company that hasn't done anything for four years that is gradually circling the drain? Because now, it had its own baked in smart home uh, system. But But here's the thing. They're just... They're a box that controls things via a bunch of open protocols and standards and things like that, which is what all of these things are. There's nothing that Wink does right now that differentiates them from any of the other smart home products. And that's part of the problem they have. There's no super cool feature you can only get on a Wink Hub. And in fact, 
it's more locked down than things like Hubitat and Smart Things, where at one point in time, folks could write their own little applications and applets and write their own custom code to do things. Wink was, here's the tools that we have. You can write some if-else statements that basically trigger things if you want. So it's never been as open as some of the other things. And that was probably their first mistake they made, which was not opening things up so that you could be more of a power user, for lack of a better term. Well, and okay, that's, Chris. that's where I think they probably should have gone with this. I think they should have probably gone with charging for certain features. Like, well, here's an example. I, I, Smart things, Hubitat, both don't do the the w- user sharing that Wink does. Uh, Smart things does user sharing, but it's all or none. With 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 uh, Wink, you can go and you can say, I want to share this device with Chris. So when I want to give him access to my nightstand light, I can share just my nightstand light with Chris Farrell. Uh, but with smart things, I'd have to share all of my devices with Chris. They should have gone and they should have been like, okay, this is a feature that's a niche product that some people won't want, but some people will really want. And we'll charge you 10 bucks a year or something, right? Like, And I would have been one that if, if I was still in with the Wink, I go, okay, I'll pay you the 10 bucks a year for that. That's fine. They should have picked in and chosen individual pieces. That also puts the writing on the wall. And I think that's probably the better benefit. That's probably the better way they should have gone because that is a feature that they have that others don't have. Okay, Chris, let me put it this way. You have been willed, whatever. You now own Wink. And it's up to you to turn it around. What do you do to turn it around? Try and sell it. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what their solution is to fix it at this point in time, because I think they've been lapped by other folks because of the cash deficit they had. I, they're, they're so far behind at this point in time in bleeding users and subscribers. I don't know how you fix it. And we've talked about in this show before how smart home automation has kind of pivoted away from having a box in your house that controls everything to having a service like Amazon's or Google's that basically uses various APIs and calls like that that controls from their cloud. I mean, if you wanted to try and make this be more beneficial, what it needs to be is something like Hubitat, which is a box in your house that can work without cloud connectivity. Supposedly, Wink 2 could do that, but I'm not 100% sure it actually worked. I I agree. I don't think it worked. But I think we've given Wink enough exposure here, even though we've uh, berated them for a while. Uh, They've got enough on this show. So let's go ahead and move on to the clipper. What clipper are we speaking of, SP? The Delta Clipper. The Delta Flyer? No, Clipper. Oh, the Delta Flyer. We're going to talk no, that's Star not Trek what Voyager. I said. I said the Delta well, Clipper. Uh, Star Trek Voyager. I'm looking forward to this news point. Uh, it has uh, very little to do with Star Trek Voyager. What we're talking about is a upcoming solar system probe that the United States that NASA is building that we haven't talked about on the podcast before. It is called the Europa Clipper or just Clipper. And it is a spacecraft that is in the process of being built that will allegedly launch around the 2024 time frame. I'm betting that's going to be delayed and go to the Jupiter moon Europa. Now, this was information that I got from a space doc- spacenews.com article by Jeff Faust, and then I supplemented it with a couple of older space.com articles. Basically, the spacecraft Clipper is due to launch in the mid-2020s, currently scheduled for 2024, to explore the Jupiter icy moon of Europa. Europa is one of the most intriguing worlds in our solar system for scientists that are interested in understanding whether life exists beyond Earth. Because... An ocean hidden below Europa's icy shell could potentially host microbial life similar to that found near deep sea vents here on Earth. A clipper is set to collect information that would give scientists a more detailed understanding of the moon. However, cost overruns on three instruments for NASA's Europa Clipper spacecraft led NASA to consider dropping them from the mission and ultimately requiring significant changes to the rest of them. At a July 9th briefing to the Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Sciences of the National Academies, NASA officials said they recently conducted, quote, continuation slash termination reviews, unquote, for three instruments, a camera, an infrared imaging spectrometer, and a mass spectrometer. 
Now, the leadership of NASA's Science Mission Directive recently decided to keep all three instruments, at least for now. However, there will be changes to some instruments, particularly to the Mass Spectrometer for Planetary Exploration slash Europa, aka MASPEX, including a change in the principal investigator from a gentleman by the name of Hunter Waite to a gentleman by the name of Jim Birch. Both, by the way, are from the Southwest Research Institute. MASPLEX is design, designed to measure the composition of Europa's very tenuous atmosphere and any plumes of material that erupt from its surface. Clipper, by the way, has a budget of $4.25 billion, it's billion with a B, and is scheduled to launch on the new SLS rocket by the direction of Congress. Although NASA is currently seeking relief from that mandate due to the amount and rate of SLS boosters now needed for the Artemis Human Exploration Program. So guys, there's going to be a mission to Europa in the mid-2020s. It's going to come about the same time that we're going to go back to the moon. SLS is still in development. This Clipper spacecraft is in development, but it's might or might not happen in 2024 my guess is probably about 2023 to 2027 i'd have to look at the launch windows but we're sending a spacecraft to go to the ocean in europa um what about your oma uh you're talking about not a moon oh okay fair enough <laughs> that was a joke uh okay so let me let me ask you this do you think that the price tag is worth it, Mr. Pioneer? That's a hefty pipe price tag. It is, for, especially for an interplanetary mission. We've done much more with much less in the past. However, you take a look at the very uniqueness of the hardware and software that are needed for such a mission. I could see it being about this time. We only have a chance to launch something like this every once in a while because of orbital parameters of how to get from point A to point B and you have to take advantage of those launch windows and when you do when you go there you just don't want to go there and sit around and do nothing you want to actually do something that's meaningful so the instrumentation that is built for these probes is very very important is 4.25 billion dollars worth it I don't know. It, it really depends on if we really do find some evidence that life could be there that could be a hot spot for uh, the fact that life could originate on multiple places, not just here on Earth, which would be big. So it, is it worth the cost? I don't know. Uh, you know that somebody, though, was like cutting whatever cost they could so they could get it at like the 4.25. Because once you go over that threshold, then people start to think about uh, being 5 billion and 5 sounds a lot bigger than 4. So they're like, yeah, well, let's see if we get that down to 4.25. 5 <laughs> is bigger than 4. In Thank terms you, of space exploration, 4 billion, 5 billion, who cares, right? <laughs> you know that somebody was thinking, well, we can get approval for this. But is 6 bigger than 5, Stephen? <laughs> uh, let me check. I'll get back to you at the end of the show. <laughs> I didn't go into all the specifics of the cost of each individual um, scientific instrument and the fact that they've already canceled one but they are trying to stay within a budget because they only have so much of a slice of the pie that nasa gets and the rest is going to other things like Wait, these missions pie? to mars yes 3.14 i've heard pie. it's a moon pie why didn't you lead with that because i knew that you'd focus on eating pie and we're not talking about mm. eating pie we're talking about the scientific pie mm. there is pie involved in orbital mechanics well, no. meringue or coconut or yeah no hmm. Hmm. and you said this was um jupiter's icy moon so it's like like a cold pie what more like a freezy okay fair enough or a slushy <laughs> well thank you very much for attempting to educate us on here i uh, don't know that i think you educated the audience but chris and i we uh we clearly are just we're too thick it never takes with us. Oh, obviously, you both still have your wink hubs. <laughs> no, it, it's in the trash, actually. <laughs> My, mine is in a, in a bin in the garage, which will <laughs> eventually go in that shed. Uh, all right. So moving on to the next thing here. 
Chris Farrell, some people might know him as Mario. And so he's going to share a, uh, a story with you out of his personal life. I, I kind of want to explain. I kind of want to understand why people would know me as Mario, Stephen. There is no Italian in my ancestry. Uh, I thought you were a plumber. Uh, no. Oh, no. well, then never mind. I take that. Back. I just plumb the depths of the Internet. I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about this Super Mario breaking records. So I think I talked about on this show last year that we'd had a record of a sealed copy of the Super Mario Brothers original NES game selling for about a little over $100,000, which is an insane price. Well, the record didn't last long. This is a game that came out almost 35 years ago. And just recently, a mint copy of the U.S. version of Super Mario Brothers sold for $114,000 at Heritage Auctions. Like I said earlier, this broke the earlier record of $100,000. That makes it, according to game collector and journalist Chris Kohler, the most expensive game ever sold to date. So how does a game from the Nintendo Entertainment System sell for such a high price? What is it that made it so collectible? Well, much like comic books, and Stephen, you know... You can grade comic books. We've pro- you probably talked about grading comic books back in the day on the Fanboy Buzz. And people would get things and store them in slabs and stuff like that, yeah? Uh, the only value that I understand comes from a comic book is once you've signed it. That's the only value. Once Chris has yeah, signed it? Yeah, Chris, Chris has signed it, yeah. Okay. Okay, so they do have a grading process for video games. It's very similar to what you see with comic books and other things like that, where a game can be graded and given a max score out of 10. This copy of Mario Brothers graded out at a 9.4 out of 10, meaning it's near perfect condition with everything sealed in the original packaging. Yes, Stephen. Is 9.4 higher than (laughs) 9.3? I'll get back to you at the end of the show on that. Depends on if it's new math or not. <laughs> oh, God. I don't understand new math whatsoever. whatsoever. I don't either. And I had to teach it to my kids. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was bad. I taught them my way and then they got Fs. <laughs> so going back to the game here, it is also even more rare because this particular version of the U.S. retail edition went through a few different iterations. And this game has something called cardboard hang tabs on it that make it super collectible. I didn't really know exactly what a cardboard hang tab was, so I was able to go on this article on The Verge and find out more where they said cardboard hang tabs originally used on the U.S. test market copies of black box games before plastic was used to seal each game. This is pretty much a little cardboard hook that's on the top of the packaging. As Nintendo began to further establish their company in the United States, their packaging was updated almost continuously. Strangely, the addition of the plastic wrap came before the box cutting die was altered to remove this cardboard hang tab. This rendered the functionality of the hang tab completely useless since it was under the plastic seal. If we're not getting crazy enough at how we're looking at these variants, there's now four sub-variants of this plastic sealed cardboard hang tag box. This particular version was a three-code variant that were produced within the span of one year. Each sub-variant of the cardboard hang tab black box produced within the time frame had a production period of just a few months, which is basically a drop in the bucket compared to the title's overall production run. Basically, a cardboard hang tank, excuse me, cardboard hang tab copy of the early game is considered hard to find in vintage because it's super rare. So the fact we've got this sealed in plastic, it's one of the cardboard hang tab editions. What also adds to its value? Well, Super Mario Brothers is one of the highest selling games of all time on the original NES console. In addition to being the first entry in the Mario Brothers series and marking the first appearance of the villain Bowser. It's historic. In in a lot of people's eyes, that makes it collectible. Granted, most collectibles are only worth what people are going to pay, but this seems like something that some collector thought was worth $114,000, plus probably some kind of commission and things like that. Maybe one day we'll know who they are, but we have no idea now because the winner was an anonymous bidder. So I'm assuming Steven purchased this and I'll be getting it for Christmas this year. So Steven, thank you so much for my sealed copy of Super Mario Brothers. I'm totally going to take it out of the packaging and play it on one of my NESs. Thank you. I will definitely send you some cardboard as your gift. Cardboard hang tabs that Mm -hmm. I can put on other boxes? Yeah. And then try and sell them as fakes on eBay? (laughs) Uh, This is, yeah, that's absolutely what I'm going to do. But this is is, uh, not surprising. There's huge, 
huge market for nostalgia. And let's be honest, there is a lot of nostalgia with NES and Mario. So not surprising. And I'm going to be honest, it seems low. Uh, you, I expect to see a higher one day. It's the high, well, I mean, that seems to be the trend we've seen is yeah. that it will be higher. Now, this is in better condition and arguably more rare than the previous version it sold for like $101,000 or whatnot. But I'm sure as more of these are found, we'll see that happen. I mean, we used to see it back in the day with like baseball cards and stuff like that. Remember when it was a Wayne Gretzky or Todd McFarlane bought that Honus Wagner original <laughs> baseball card that was in near pristine condition and prices skyrocketed and then the market fell out the bottom on baseball cards and most of them aren't worth anything now. Right. Uh, you mentioned CDC grading, and I was under the impression that if you ever think that y- you have a valuable comic, uh, you should always open it up, at, you know, like look at every single page, touch it, inspect it all with bare hands, right? You should wear it down a bit. Is that right? No, no. <laughs> you should lather your hands in hand sanitizer. Right. Make sure that they're not dried. Right. So when you touch the comic book, that none of your germs will get on it you know what you should probably do too just to be safe uh once you have opened it or or got it you should open it up and use lysol on it you know really yeah just make sure yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. well i mean cgc grading is semi-controversial among some folks that feel that comics are something you should be able to open and enjoy and the fact that some people will take a comic the day it comes out at a con go get someone to sign it and stick it behind a slab of plastic for the rest of its life there's mm-hmm. arguments as to whether that's what you should do or not do with it, but that is arguably the best way to potentially make money or at least seal in the value and authenticate that it was signed by someone. I'm not a huge CGC comic book person. I've got a few CGC books in my collection, mostly because they were autographed ones, which are ones that I wanted to hang on my wall. Other than that, I don't have a ton. All kidding aside, you should not do any of the things we said if you think you have a valuable comic. And uh, Kent in our chat mentions wear white cotton gloves and put it in a safe never to be seen. I don't know. You, you guys know of the moisture that builds up in saves, mm, that's by true. the way? That's true. Yeah, that's, so can't... That's why there's white. a lot of, like, DC Comics. I think it was in one of Mark Hamill's show. Oh, I can't remember the name of his show he had that was on, like, Sci-Fi Channel or streamed online where he went and found collectibles and stuff like that. He actually went to the DC archives. And like they had a bunch of old books out on display and stuff like that. It's in a climate controlled room, humidity controlled and stuff like that, because you're talking about books that are from like the thirties and forties that are pretty well aged and would be considered delicate if they weren't stored correctly. So I think there's a difference between CGC collecting and preserving like that for preservation's sake. Like I could understand if someone was going to take one of those classic books and slab it so that it was protected but it's not really like you need to go and buy 10,000 copies of Iron Man number one when it drops in two weeks, whenever they reboot it next and slab it and expect anything to come out of it. As far as this Super Mario Brothers copy for $114,000, I know nothing about video game collectibles. And I'm just thinking that wouldn't the market be bigger in maybe Asia than the United States for these unique things, even though that they're United States games Aren't they, isn't the market bigger overseas in Asia? I don't know. I defer to our resident expert, Chris Farrell. Uh, Also hand sanitizer expert, Chris Farrell. It depends. I was trying to dig something out I had behind me because we were talking about CGC stuff, but I'll get to that in a second. It honestly depends on where the collector's from. I mean, when it comes to something like this, I think this collector could be from anywhere in the world and be a fan. I would think that probably if you're in the Japanese markets, you may not care as much about the American release of the games because oftentimes the Japanese release has a different kind of box art. It's in Japanese language and stuff on the front. So my guess is probably not as big on international stage. I honestly don't know. I'm not a huge game collector. I like to play them and I have a bunch of digital games because I don't like to hold on to them forever. I am a big believer of what Chris said earlier in the fact that you should enjoy the things that you have. So uh, that's why I personally have a uh, a photo frame on my nightstand of Chris Farrell and it just shows pictures of Chris Farrell. And so I enjoy him every night. There you go. I got a couple CGC books here that were just waiting to be filed that I bought years ago because I got them for dirt cheap and they were hanging on my wall at one point in time because I had frames that would hold CGC slabs. So honestly, why I bought them 
because I was at a con, they were cheap, and I went, oh, that would look cool on my wall. Would storing them on your wall actually degrade them over time, though? No. I, I, had a, I had frames that were built literally to hold these slabs, so it wasn't putting any pressure on them. And these things block UV light, and they're sealed, oh, okay. so it's not going to do anything. Ah. Uh. And uh, a couple of quick extra extras before we go to SP Space Symposium. Uh, let's start off with a piece of sad news. SP, what did you have here? Yeah, unfortunately, this came out this morning, and I'm I'm usually not huge into celebrities passing away or anything like that because I just I'm not huge into celebrity fandom for whatever reason. But Kelly Preston passed away after a couple year long battle of breast cancer and she passed away uh, yesterday at the age of 57 and it's kind of shocking to me to think of her in terms of being 57 because i always remember her from way back when back in the 80s as being one of the space camp actors and i just watch that today uh she's one of my favorite actors she's been in a lot of great stuff to the two movies that i think most about her are space camp and for love of the game excellent actor she did a, a few others probably most noted just because the box office was bigger for jerry Maguire than anything else but i think she, she really shined in for the love of the game and space camp was just her having fun you watch the film and she is having a blast making those scenes and um we're not going to get any more films from her but it is great to see go back and see her work so uh, kelly preston passed away at the age of 57 and at the heart of a lot of geeks with space camp back in the 80s sky high in the 2000s and lastly in our extra extra we're gonna quickly mention apple uh because why not let's talk about apple we should make that our mission of this show every single episode let's talk something apple no, there is a uh, new research note that there are analysts from Wedbush that say that Apple will likely go ahead with their September launch of the next iPhones. However, they probably won't be available until October. That's what's currently being said right now. Wait a uh, minute. What does John Prosser have to say about the don't, subject? Don't, he says whatever is right. Uh, but the the reason I wanted to mention this is because I think everybody needs to accept that things are all messed up this year and that releases, we can't count on what we have traditionally seen in the past. So Apple may go ahead with their launch in September, but know that it may not be available for purchase till October. And I think it's also important that if you're not in America, in the United States, to remember that there was a time where other countries were also having to wait after uh, the U.S. launch and quite a significant amount of time so i kind of wonder if that's going to happen that's my personal guess is like we might see a big u.s launch and then go back to where you have to wait a month or so elsewhere i wonder if the launch will start other places like lately we've been seeing the launch start in like new zealand so or in australia so that you saw them get it first mm. and it would generate interest in the morning news here right. in north america for people to actually go out to the stores and try to get them so I wonder if they're going to try to do that in smaller markets, because New Zealand is a small market in comparison to other places, yet they have all the infrastructure there for a uh, full iPhone breath. Here's well, my thoughts on it. My thoughts on it is Apple is an American company, U.S. company. And so if there is a, a market shortage, who is their best person that they should try to uh, benefit? It's, it's their country, the U.S. So... I think that you probably, if there is a shortage, you'll have it contained to the U.S. That's my personal theory. But in any case, it's just a matter of knowing that there may be delays. Uh, people are still wondering if the Pixel 4a will launch the same time as the Pixel 5. Uh, I don't know what's happening over with the Google, but I think that it's just uh, one of the many signs that Release schedules all messed up this year. I'm, I'm going to put my conspiracy theory hat on here for a second, Stephen. Okay. Can, can you can, can conspiracize, like that, please? It's a convenient way to say we're in the middle of a pandemic where a bunch of people are out of work and don't want to spend money on a new $1,000 phone. So sales are going to be down. So we'll say availability is going to be down. So we're not putting a ton of phones out that sit on shelves because people can't afford to buy them. The when there's probably out. something along those lines, but there's also something along the lines of just pure availability because the 
the uh, manufacturing factories that make this stuff, they're dealing with the same pandemic as everywhere else. So supply chains are delayed and everything. And I just want to note that of the three, and, and this will be four, because I am probably going to buy a 12, of the four iPhones that I will have bought after the 12, three of them have been delayed. So the 4S, the 6 Plus, and because of the bending issue with the 6 Plus, I have no <laughs> idea why the 4S was. Uh, the 8 Plus that I have came out normal, so that was good. Uh, but the 12 will be delayed. So three out of the four that I will have bought for my personal use will have been delayed. But let's be honest also, when it comes to these phones anymore, it doesn't matter. It's Android, iOS, whatever. It's not the big media spectacle that it was six years ago or eight years ago when it was, oh my God, I have to have this. Now it's like, oh, that's cool. There's a couple of new things that are really interesting on that. And you've got a bunch, you've got a smaller group of people that are really engaged and say they have to have it immediately. But it's not like it was before when people were lining up in the middle of the street for days to get one of these phones. We're past that point now. So when I had the 4S and I was scrapping by on that third year to get the 6 Plus, I literally had to take that phone apart and replace the battery, replace the speakers, replace... There's one other thing that I had to replace in there. And I was just making it limp along to the point where I could actually get by the six plus when it came out the eight. And we've talked about it before on the show. I've got the eight plus it's three year old phone. It's still working, even though I drove over it. I mean, this thing is amazing from that perspective and I am glad, but I don't need a new phone because I want the new gadgets. I need a new phone because the battery is going down because the phone is just wearing out. And I don't want to get to that point where I'm having to make it limp along to get to the 13 or what the 14 or whatever they want to call the next one. So yeah, I, I'm going to get a new phone. I've already said that I was probably going to be the flagship phone for me because just because I like that and my eyes are really bad. So I, I want a bigger screen. So yeah, there, there you go. And I'm going to get one of these in October or January, February, whenever it comes out. Uh, probably about the same time that you get your next Apple TV. But let's go ahead and move on to uh, uh, Space Rocker. Symposium. <laughs> So just a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to tell you guys the story of Mariner 9. This time, I am going to tell the story of Mariner 10. Why is it so special? Well, it was the first spacecraft sent to study Mercury. It was also the first spacecraft to have multiple destinations along the way, use a gravity assist in the navigation, and use solar radiation as a way to maintain its attitude control system. A lot of firsts with Mariner 10. Yes, Stephen. Did it become a Spider-Man because it was exposed to radiation? Well, it wasn't hunting for gamma radiation. We talked about gamma radiation telescopes before. This was sent specifically to look at Mercury. Did it become the Hulk? No, unfortunately, uh, it ran out of attitude control gas and we never heard from it since 1975 spoiler alert yeah there you go bottom line up front uh so far in the 33 space symposiums we've only discussed spacecrafts and probes and telescope telescopes that have had a single destination somewhere orbit around earth or orbit around the sun a uh, destination of the moon venus and mars well today i'm going to talk about the Mariner 10, which had Mercury as a destination, but also had a couple other destinations along the way. So we'll get into it here. Mariner 10 was actually launched in 1973, went to both Venus, Venus and Mars. And for a bonus, it was also the first mission to use a gravity assist to change the flight path. That means it used the Venusian mass to change its trajectory and add some energy to the orbit because it, as orbits go into the sun, you need more energy in order to speed around the sun faster and faster to maintain your orbit. So Mariner 10 actually needed more energy and it got some of that energy 
by its ability to fly by Venus. Also, as I mentioned before, Mariner 10 did use the solar radiation pressure on its solar panels and the high gain antenna as a means of attitude control during the flight. Basically, you have solar pressure that's pushing against the and then they equalized that pressure and were able to point the spacecraft in a certain direction to maintain attitude control so that they could communicate with Earth and also point its scientific instruments correctly. Along the way, Mariner 10 took some ultraviolet spectrum observations of a comet along the way. That's all pretty ambitious of itself, but we also top it off as Mariner 10 was the lemon in terms of planetary exploration probes. And more about that later. Uh, Stephen, in Canada, do they have such a thing called a lemon law? No. I, I actually okay. don't know. I don't know. It's an orange law. All right. Are you familiar with the term lemon law? I am, yes. So lemon law is, is largely with cars, but it can be with other things, as in it is a faulty piece of equipment that you bought, and if... Like in a car, if it's in the shop for like 90 days in the first year that you buy it or whatever, the company actually has to buy it back and provide you another vehicle with the basically the same cost the, under law that they have to do that. Now, and you very have to diff- actually give the product back, right? So they went and right. they, they gave this back. Well, uh, they would have if they could have. So <laughs> Mariner 10 was a lemon. So that's a little spoiler for later, too. Now, the Mariner series, we talked an awful lot about Mariner so far. They were originally going to be at least a 12 spacecraft probe series. However, Mariner 10 was the last in the series. Stephen and Chris, there was a Mariner 11 and 12 mission. Do you have any idea what became of them? Suncast stole them and sold them for resale parts at his uh, junk shop on Mars. Uh, did, did, Suncast used spacecraft Emporium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They are uh, located in the same area as the ET games. That would be here on Earth, but no, that is not correct. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Billions and billions. Carl Sagan personally bought them and put them in his own personal collection? Kind of, kind of. You're on the right path there. Chris, Uh, got any? Carl Sagan is on them? I don't think so. I don't think he put his personal visage <laughs> on them. Um, As a matter of fact, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it's not. Although he, his name might be on them. I'm trying to remember. He the filmed all it. of Cosmos from out in space on top of them. That would be awesome. But no, he would didn't. be. I, I don't right. know. Okay, so I deliberately did not put them in the show notes. So these guys were re- literally guessing. It is the Voyager One and Voyager Two spacecraft. So that was Mariner <gasps> Eleven and Twelve. Yeah, there you go. Oh, so they used them on Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Gotcha. Well, I'm you were mentioning Star now. Trek Voyager earlier, so I thought I'd bring it back. Star Trek: The Motion Picture makes me sleepy just talking about it. <laughs> it does. I actually, wa- I guess I talked about it last year. Last year, I watched uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey outside. And it was, of course, night and everything. And it it was a nice night out. But, oh, man, it was hard to stay awake during that. I had a lot of of coffee to watch that thing. I know know we're digressing from SP Space Symposium here. But, you know, you should watch out there. Uh, You should actually watch First Contact uh, one evening. That would be a good backyard movie, First Contact. Actually, any movie is great out there. The neighbors love it. I, I've actually taken to placing the screen in different directions so that different neighbors actually get to watch some of these movies from <laughs> you know their what windows. You need to do. Uh, you need to put the screen in the direction that your neighbors can see, but on the back side, like put just a tarp on the bottom half so they only see half of it, so they just get <laughs> jealous. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. I actually had one neighbor request porn and I said no. <laughs> I, I don't know what regulations or legal stuff that is in my city, but no, I'm not doing that. Anyway, let's get back to Mariner 10. So the cost of Mariner 10, it had a hard ceiling of $98 million. Congress was not giving a cent more. They said $98 million for this and that's it. And remember, 1973 was about the end of the Apollo program and they were transitioning into the Skylab program and trying to gen up interest into the space shuttle. So they were trying to keep NASA on a strict budget because Congress and the American public thought it was getting too much. So they held Mariner 10 to a cost ceiling of $98 million. And spoiler, they actually made it. It came in at $97 million. So good on NASA. 
for that. And just to give you an idea how much that was, so 1973, $98 million. If you convert that to 2020 US dollars, I didn't do the Canadian conversion, it would be $566 million. So just over a half a billion dollars. So we just talked about Europa Clipper coming in at $4.25 billion. This was Mariner 10, which would have come in at 0.5 billion dollars. So that's how the cost of these probes have gone up over time. By the way, Boeing built Mariner 10. So we're pretty big on backups here on the Guinea Geek Network for our podcasting endeavors, talking about backup ways to actually podcast, backup data, backup recordings. Well, it turns out that NASA was also big into backups in the early days of space exploration. Often spacecraft were launched in pairs with a sister spacecraft in order to mitigate risk. We talked about that before with Mariner 9. Remember, Mariner 9 actually made it, but its companion did not. Question for you. Was there a Mariner 11? That would be Voyager 1. Actually, I don't know if Mariner 11 was Voyager 1 or Voyager 2. That's a good <laughs> question, Stephen. I'll find that out for when we actually talk about the Voyagers. And Chris, are you having fun with this segment? <laughs> Stephen's killing me. He's just killing me. <laughs> well, come up with some great ideas of your own. I'll answer the questions, too. <laughs> So while Mariner 10 mission planner stayed sufficiently under budget to actually divert some funding for the construction of a backup spacecraft, the budget did not permit both to be launched at the same time. So in the event that Mariner 10 failed, NASA would only allow the backup to be launched if the fatal error was diagnosed and fixed. This would have to have been completed in the two and a half weeks between the scheduled launch on 3 November 1973 and the last possible launch date in the window of 21 November 1973. Since Mariner 10 actually launched and was functional as of 21 November, they decided not to launch the backup and then internalize that funding for other missions within NASA. What happened to that unused backup, by the way? Well, it was sent to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1982, which has been ever since. And I've got a nice little picture in the show notes of Mariner 10 as it hangs from the ceiling of the Air and Space Museum. Well, I talked about how Mariner 10 was a lemon before, right? So it launched successfully from Cape Canaveral on November 3rd, 1973, on top of an Atlas Control or Atlas Centaur rocket. And the spacecraft checked out in orbit and even took some pictures of the Earth and the moon as it departed on its cruise phase to Venus. Well, that's when the fun started. And in engineering and rocket science terms, this was quote unquote fun. I Betting a lot of people pulled the rest of their hair out and maybe even quit their jobs over this. So shortly after the launch, NASA discovered that some television camera heaters were not turned on. So Mission Control sent a command to deactivate and then reactivate these heaters, but it was unsuccessful. Luckily for NASA, those the camera temperature stabilized before it got too cold to operate. So the cameras were saved, but the heaters did not work. Steven, what do you got for me? Uh, question for you. Did they check if they paid for their Wink subscription to turn them on remotely? Well, since they were NASA, they got interest in the Wink 3 <laughs> and it was in beta while it was going on. Okay, so they didn't have enough. to worry about their subscription. They were working on the beta. Why didn't they just ask Tesla to fix it for him? There's a ship out. There's a car out there. It's got a repair kit in it, I'm sure. Remember, this was 1973, guys. This was not 2018. Yeah, we just made a wink joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to bring it back right now. All right. During the transit between Earth and Venus, the high gain antenna on board the spacecraft and the attitude control system malfunctioned. It was later determined that a paint flake caused the attitude control system to fail because it lost its fix on the bright star that it was looking at. And unfortunately, whatever paint they used was bargain basement stuff because it continued to flake during the rest of the mission and caused the attitude control system to malfunction from time to time. Now they found a fix for this, but they had to basically reset the ACS every single time that it happened. Ooh. Along the way, the onboard computer was constantly resetting. So they had to do the stereotypical tech support 
thing and turn it off and turn it on in order to get it fixed. And this happened multiple times during the mission. This is not normal for a NASA mission, by the way, this amount of failure, especially with a spacecraft that was the 10th in the series and the spacecraft bus itself was tried and true. So the fact that this thing was failing so much was really, really driving NASA people insane. So it was later determined that a short-circuited diode caused the main power regulator and inverter to fail, leaving Mariner 10 dependent on the backup regulator and inverter. So it had redundancies on, bo on board the spacecraft and they were able to do it, but that was just a myriad of one of a myriad of problems here. And oh, by the way, later in the mission, you know, later on after it had actually achieved some of its objectives, the tape recorder failed, and we'll talk about that later, so let's not get ahead of uh -oh. ourselves right there. This is why they should have used SD cards. The, mic, the, the big ones or the small ones? Either one. Okay. So let's talk about the scientific instruments on board this thing. It had two telescopes that were also cameras. They, to they talked about them as television cameras, but they were technically telescope cameras. It also had an infrared radiometer on board, an ultraviolet air glow spectrometer, an ultraviolet oculation spectrometer, a magnetometer, a charged particle telescope, and a plasma analyzer. Now, all these instruments are because Mariner 10 scientific missions included a primary goal of studying the atmosphere, if any, of Mercury, the surface and physical characteristics of Mercury as well. It was also meant to study interplanetary medium. So that's the space in between the planets. And we talked about that before in other spacecraft, but this was the first time that they were going as close to the sun as Mercury was. So they really wanted to get that interplanetary medium science done that close to the sun. It was also to experience a gravity assist. And that was used multiple times later on in missions, including Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. So that was a very important thing to do. And spacecraft to this day, Galileo used gravity assists. And we also wanted to sense Venus. Now, at that point in time, we had sent a couple of probes to Venus, but it wanted to continue the science of Venus as they went along. I mentioned that they took some ultraviolet sensing of a comet. Well, there was this comet called Kahutek, and Mariner 10 flew close enough to take some observations of it. No photographs were taken. I don't think that the camera would have been able to discern it in the background anyway. So it only took ultraviolet measurements, and that was in January of 1974. So it launched in November of 73. It had its first encounter outside of the Earth Moon area in January 1974. In February, specifically February 5th, 1974, Mariner had its first and only close encounter with Venus. In the process, Mariner 10 took 4,165 photos and it had its closest encounter at 3,584 miles, which was roughly coast to coast of North America. And it determined that the magnetic field of Venus was 1 20th that of Earth, so it doesn't have the Van Allen radiation belts that Earth does. It had a rotation period of 243 days. That's a very long day, guys. And it, you think we have a long day at work when we work like 12, 14 hours? Imagine working for like 242 days in a that row. Would, that. that would make 2020 even worse than it is already. Yeah, it would. <laughs> And they found out that what the atmosphere was comprised of, and it was mostly carbon dioxide and had some other things in there as well. So that was its close encounter with Venus. It was just a flyby around February 5th, and it went on. Finally, it reached Mercury around March 29th, 1974, and it had its closest encounter of the mission at a distance of 437 miles. If honestly, if Mercury had any sort of atmosphere whatsoever that that could have been a very bad thing, but luckily it didn't have an atmosphere uh, worth talking about, and we'll get into that in a second. So Mariner 10 had an orbit that kept the spacecraft orbiting around the sun and having close encounters with Mercury from time to time. So its first one was on March 29th, 1974. Its next one was May 9th. 
The next one was May 10th, and then the next one was July 2nd, and the final one was September 21st. What did you find out about Mercury? First of all, it had an even weaker magnetic field than Venus. It only had a magnetic field that was 1 60th that of Earth. The temperatures were wildly different in between 297 degrees Fahrenheit minus 297 degrees Fahrenheit and then a positive 369 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a wide range and it depends on if you're facing the sun or not facing the sun. Mariner 10 took 2,700 pictures with 328 foot resolution. But remember, guys, it said that Mariner 10 was a lemon. Well, guess what? The tape drive failed. So in the high resolution photos that it took, it only had the center quarter of the pictures that they were able to send back. <laughs> so awkward. at least they got something. Yeah. A little awkward there. So some of the features that it found out from Mercury is it has this very large uh, calorous basin, which has concentric rings and ridges that are 1,550 miles in diameter, probably due to a huge asteroid or moon strike or something like that. It, the surface of Mercury basically looks like that of the moon with a lot of craters on it and very little atmosphere. It does have an atmosphere. It's faint and it's made mostly of helium. So at the end, we're going to talk about how Mariner went out. All told, Mariner took about 7,000 photos of the Earth, the Moon, Venus, and Mercury. That's 7,000. It also had one heck of a composite that NASA was able to stitch together of Mercury. So it was the first close-up views that we had of Mercury. And on or about March 24th, 1975, Mariner 10 ran out of fuel for its attitude control system, so they weren't able to control it anymore, and it stopped contacting, basically because the antenna wasn't pointing towards the Earth anymore. So that's the last time we heard from Mariner 10. Mariner 10 is presumed to still be orbiting around the sun, but we don't know what shape it is in. Uh, and also Mariner 10 was the first and only probe to visit Mercury for another 33 years until Messenger was sent to Mercury in 2008. So that just tells you how long it could be even for the planets here on the inside of the solar system for us to go back to. I know we just sent uh, New Horizons to Pluto, but when's the next time we're going to get to do that? I have no idea. So this was 33 years between missions to Mercury. Guys, you got any comments on Mariner 10 here? Well, you said that Mariner 10 had close encounters on May 9th, 10th, July 2nd, and September 21st, and that the closest it ever got was 437 miles. That's yep. a lot of a lot of spaced out dates that it was able to to see Mercury. So I guess it was kind of a long distance relationship type situation. Definitely. Most of the other encounters were thousands or tens of thousands of miles away. Uh -huh. I hate having encounters that far away. Well, it's like, you know, a coronavirus quarantine relationship where you're not supposed to get together, but uh, you do every once in a while. Fair enough. I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. The damaged photos or the photos that weren't fully rendered because of the damaged camera. Did they still get useful information out of what they could see? Or was it just kind of, oh, crap? Yeah, they got information that basically mapped out a lot of mercury which they weren't able to see mercury is so close to the sun okay. that even telescopes can't see it very well without an atmosphere that's one of the problems with venus its atmosphere is so dense we can't see through it well this we can't see it just because it's so close to the sun but it was able to get a lot of those great pictures to basically say that other bodies out there like the moon get hit with a lot of asteroids and looks pot-marked like the moon and what year did the Magic School Bus go to Mercury? I don't know. Chris, you're more versed on the Magic School Bus than I am. Eh, probably in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> okay. <sighs> well, that's it for Mercury. Next time, I'm going to tell the story of Pioneer 11, which was the first spacecraft to encounter Saturn. I've got a lot more racked and stacked up after that. We have Voyager 1 and 2 on deck. We have... Magellan and Galileo, Mars Observer, Clementine, Near Shoemaker. So a lot of other probes we have to discuss. And if you want to hear more about what we've already covered or what I've already covered, 
you can go to snasa.space and that will bring up all of the previous episodes on the guineageek.com website. I should probably make sure that's all up to date. I'll write that down. I have. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. No, seriously, all kidding aside, I know I always make wild jokes, but thank you very much for doing SP Space Symposium. Greatly do appreciate it. Uh, I know I personally learn a lot every time that you do enlighten us on space history. And one day, one day we will get to that time travel where the Borg came and did a whole bunch of things and Anyways, we'll get there eventually. If you want to do Star Trek history on this podcast as a segment, you are more than welcome to do that. Is Star Trek not a part of history? Well, you have to assume that everything that has been shown on TV is historic in some way, shape, manner, or form. Yes, the cape is real. I knew you were going to take it outside of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so all Star Trek that has been shown is part of canon at some point. So yeah, it's all historic. You could do that. You you could literally take something like the Borg and talk about all of the encounters of the Borg with Star Trek. It's better if I just crack wild jokes during your educational segments. I'm just trying to give you another segment that might be... Hey, listener, if you want to hear Steven talk about Star Trek history, like the Borg and all the encounters with Star Trek Starfleet ships and crews, leave him a message and he'll oblige you. It does give me a good idea. I could, I could talk about all of the encounters in Star Trek, if you know what I mean. You could Captain do that Kirk. too. You could get your brother here to do a segment every once in a while. I bet you he would love to do that. Uh, as I'm not bringing my brother in to talk about encounters. It's not happening. <laughs> All, All right. right. Let's go ahead and wrap up the show. Before we go, uh, Chris Farrell, is there anything that you would like to plug or promote? I heard that you do a podcast on Saturday mornings, is it? Yes, that's the uh, Steven Cast at stevencast.com, where we break down Steven's performance play by play on every podcast he's done this week. Is we that roll with a K or a C? Both. I bought both domains. <laughs> I need to make sure I can get both. But it's just like watching uh, John Madden when he was covering sports. We get the tele little pencils out and start going boom. And then Steven went to here and he said this and it was bad. But he circled back and said this. So stevencast.com, Saturday mornings. We break down all of Steven's podcast appearances for the week. I can picture you yelling like John Madden. I, I can totally I don't do have, it. I don't have a John Madden voice. <laughs> That'd be awesome. You can make the Turduncan for every Thanksgiving and have but it live I, on the stream. I, I, I could, in theory, take my Surface book here with OBS Ninja on it and then be able to draw diagrams as a video plays of what you're doing on screen and have that be embedded on a video. That is being played back for the users. So stevencast.com, we're up in our game and soon we'll be drawing funny little pictures on top of Steven's face while he talks. Well, let's find out what's at stevencast.com. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't want to do that. I didn't even I didn't even check before I said it. So uh, full disclosure, if you go there and it's porn, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anything that you would like to plug or promote, Stargate Pioneer? Yeah, I would like to promote the new podcast that you two are doing called WinkCast, which you can find <laughs> at WinkCast.com. And it's all about how Stephen and Chris find out everything that you can do with the Wink Home Hub system. Yeah, throw it in my trash can. That's about all I'm down to now. <laughs> I am not doing that. I, I refuse to hurt myself more than I've already been hurt. Like... <laughs> that that is I've I've suffered for a long time. I've gone through every single problem that I've ever had uh it, that I've ever had with smart automation through Wink and it's just one of those things that I just have no desire to spend any more time talking about Wink other than all of the times that I talk about Wink on here because you know I I do. I talk I talk a lot a lot about it. So you talk a lot period. Oh, uh, well, let me ask you this, Stargate Pioneer. If I was wanting to talk and watch people talk about the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. television show, how would I do that? Where would I go? What would the best place be that I could learn all about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Where could I learn all about that? That would be at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., which you can find at the network, or if you 
have a problem typing in guineageek.com, you can also type in legendsofshield.com. That should take you to the landing page on the guineageek.com website. We'll talk all about Marvel. We've been doing it for years, specifically seven years. How do I know that? Is because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is in the seventh year. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. was started as an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast. We have covered everything in Marvel up to now, except for some of those Netflix Defender series, which we are getting back to. But yeah, we've covered it all, and it is available for you to listen to over two, 340 episodes right now. What did you think of last week's episode? I enjoyed it. It was fun it was campy it had 80s horror elements into it with a ton of blood so it's not for the faint of heart but it was a fun and it was needed the lightness of that episode was needed after the previous week and all the heavy stuff that hit us then yeah it was fun uh let's go ahead though and wrap things up as i find out that one of them have registered it uh for episode number 338 of the official gonna geek.com show i'm steven john drew saying find out what happened to the 988 that i just gave to namecheap because i paid for it It failed someone has it msp see everybody (laughs) at better podcasting i'm chris farrell telling you five is greater than four. <laughs> Five. <laughs> there are four <laughs> lights. <laughs>checking out another episode of the official gunnageek.com show if you like the show please give us a five-star review in apple podcasts or a thumbs up on youtube you can always join us for our live recording sessions which stream mondays at 8 45 p.m eastern at www.geeks.live and remember you can find our full back catalog at gunnageek.com forward slash show If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on gunnageeknetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week.